The town clerk informs me <laughs> that we have a quorum present, and I call to order the sixth and final session <laughs> of the fall town meeting. Take your seats, please. I have a few announcements before we begin. I've been asked to uh, announce that this year is the 25th annual town toy drive, and uh, you can check the town website for uh, the procedures and drop-off points. I have a couple of revised electronic voting counts. On Article 31, the main motion, the final count, I think final, is 193 in favor, one opposed, and five abstentions. Article 25, the main motion, the count is 178 in favor, nine opposed, and 12 abstentions. <coughs> I remind you of our time limits, uh, except for those who have uh, consulted me and been granted extra time, the maximum time for presenters of each side of an article is five minutes, and ev for everyone else, it's three minutes. Let me say just a word about points of order. Uh, we were deluged with them last night, and most of them were not, in fact, points of order. Uh, a point of order is a point raising, raising a point about the legality or uh, propriety of our town meeting and the procedures. Uh, a point of order is not for the purpose of asking a question. And uh, I commend to all of you the write-up, the description of points of order and questions of privilege on page 22 of the town meeting handbook. With that, we turn to Article 24. The main motion under Article 24 is on the orange supplement, pages 1 through 8. It's uh, an amendment of the bylaw relating to the Commission for Diversity and relates to its complaint procedures. It's moved by Mr. Conquest. Is there a second? second. Moving is second. Seconded. Uh, the, there is one amendment being offered on the Lavender Supplement. The amendment, if you turn to page 8 of the uh, orange supplement number 6, the last page of the main motion, uh, Ms. Nobrega moves to delete the final sentence, the sentence in bold in the middle of page 8, and to provide in a separate sentence that the amendments set forth in this motion, that is the motion before you this evening, shall be effective on July 1, 2021. That's moved by Ms. Nobrega. Is there a second? Seconded. We have two motions to refer. The first is on page uh, 8 of the yellow supplement. I'm sorry, page 3 of the yellow supplement. Uh, <clears throat> Move to refer the subject matter raised by Article 24 to a moderator's committee etc. It's moved by Ms. Stamfer, seconded by Mr. Rosenthal. There is a substitute motion to refer on page one of the same yellow supplement. That's supplement number one to Article 24. Motion to refer the subject matter of the article to the D, uh, DICR. Moved by Mr. Green, seconded by Ms. Hamilton. It's on page one of the yellow supplement. So we have two motions to refer and a main motion and an amendment. And when it comes time to vote, I will describe the voting procedures and effect. Mr. Conquest. And Ms. Stamfer, would you please come forward?
Mr. Sandman is uh, standing in for Ms. Stamper and is the moving party for the moderator's committee motion. I have a cell phone that was cell phone that was found in the ladies' room. It's with the town clerk, if it's yours. Uh, a message from John Porco is uh, the person. <laughs> Mr. Conquest, you have seven minutes. Good evening, everyone. Um, Arthur Conquest, town meeting member, precinct six. There is a culture of racism in Brookline. It's not the Dylan Ruth type of racism. Racism here is much more cunning and suave, where interlopers heap praise on themselves as being social justice ad advocates who support liberal and progressive causes. We blacks, as inferior species, must do as we're told or be marginalized as quote unquote troublemakers. I can't possibly explain in the short time I have at the podium here, but maybe I'll host a forum or call a special town meeting um, to explain the profundity of the disease of racism that exists in Brookline. And no, I don't believe that everyone in this auditorium or the town is a racist. On the other hand, you don't live with our skin color. Bylaw 3.14 states that the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations, also known as DICR, would be established to address the disease of racism by supporting welcoming a welcoming environment that fosters cooperation, tolerance, and respect among and by all persons who come in contact with the town, including residents, visitors, persons uh, passing through the town, employees, employers, job applicants, and by advocating, promoting, and advocating for the human and civil rights through education, awareness, outreach, and advocacy. Valuing diversity and inclusion in and for the Brookline community, Dicker's goal is to support a welcoming atmosphere. The authors of 3.4 define inclusion as actively pursuing goals of interconnecting, integrating, engaging, and welcoming Brookline's uh, persons who come in contact with the town regardless of their race, color, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, age, race, religion, creed, ancestry, etc., making all of the aforementioned part of the town's protected class. But segments of the protected class, blacks, Latinx, and people of color residents and visitors are really what I call the targeted class. They're stopped by the police more often, whether it's driving or just walking on the street, entering public buildings, or even while trying to vote as at polling station on election day. Black children are called monkeys by their teachers and far worse by other students in the public schools. The 3.14 bylaw states that incidents like some of those just mentioned could be handled by Dicker and the town's de facto, the town's de facto Civil Rights Commission. But Dicker is like a roaring tiger with no teeth. Um, it was purposely created that way by the white power structure to be powerless and take the targeted class on a journey to nowhere, as in refer complaints to the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination or a political pally of the Brookline apartheid light system. Hence, there is no public record of racial injustice in Brookline. Complaints filed just get swept under the rug and the complaint to MCAD fall into the hole, into a hole where they can, where they can be lost for up to five or six years before they are addressed. 
there's an appearance that there are laws in place to combat racism and discrimination, that something is being done to assist the black, Latino, and people of color protect the class, when in fact the town's bylaws are totally deceiving and bankrupt. All branches of town government, the select board, the advisory committee, CTOS, and DICA have filed uh, substitute motions to refer warrant article 24 for study with a moderators committee or back to DICA. This is a facsimile of what bylaw 3.14 was falsely created to do in the first place in 2000 and 18 by a group of so-called experts who haven't walked a single step in the shoes of the targeted class. It's like men having the power to rule on Roe versus Wade. Referring Warren Article 24 to a moderators committee is the equivalent of burying, burying it, hide it for up to a year with no guarantee that things will change for the better. On the 23rd of February, 2016, the then chair of DICA read the following statement, and I quote, the Board of Selectmen as an institution of town government has allowed a culture of institutional racism to exist. The commission calls upon you as the elected leaders of this town to exercise your responsibilities and duties as the elected representative of this town to stamp out the culture. There must not be a delay. You must act with expedience. There is a history in this town of not taking action on these matters in a timely manner. You must not repeat this history. This is a matter of extreme urgency, which the Board of Selectmen needs to address with action, not words, now. The aforementioned statement was met with the three card monte, three card monte tr trickery by the town's power structure. While there were a series of threats and intimidating demands made on members of DICA that bullied them into retracting the aforementioned statement, which I witnessed firsthand. I'm not scared of anyone. I am not your Negro said the great James Baldwin. So vote yes for Warren Article 24, the main motion. Do not be complicit in continuing to transmit and support racism and social injustice in Brookline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sandman. Is that under seven minutes? Yes. Thank you. Seven. 7.3. Mike Sandman for the advisory committee, substituting for Claire Stamper, who scheduled a trip to Salt Lake City, not believing that we could possibly have a six session town meeting. Um, despite state laws against discrimination and town bylaws, members of groups identified in both state statutes and the town bylaw that created the commission on diversity, inclusion, and community relations and the associated department uh, encounter mistreatment that they perceive as being based on bias. This affects people of color as well as seniors and members of the LGBTQT community. Perception is often reality and in many cases, the perception is indeed correct. The petitioner wishes to provide an effective mechanism to investigate such instances and most important, create some mechanism to respond to them. Thus, the purpose of Article 24 is to provide for a citizen complaint procedure by giving the commission quasi-judicial investigative powers. When the commission was established by town meeting in 2014, consideration was given to providing it with exactly those powers to investigate and draw conclusions on citizen complaints of discrimination. Town meeting decided not to include those powers in the commission's brief. Article 24 would modify the general bylaw that establish the commission and give it that power. A public hearing by the ad hoc subcommittee assigned to review Article 24 heard descriptions of many instances of bias and mistreatment encountered in the course of life 
of, of day-to-day -day life of members of protected classes of our, our fellow citizens, fellow residents, I beg your pardon, uh, in, in Brookline. And the advisory committee recognizes that bias is real. It really happens. And we agree that there should be a way for victims to get, and they are victims, to get effective help through a mechanism that's overseen by the town of Brookline. One reason for the need for doing this is that referral of relatively minor instances of bias are not given, by pri given priority by the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, which does have quasi-legal powers. When both um, the Office of, this, of uh, Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations and the Commission were established, the study committee that developed the enabling bylaw cautioned that a volunteer appointed body subject to the open meeting law should not be involved in specific matters that involve complex privacy rights and labor law. Article 24 would involve volunteers in exactly that way. If this commission is assigned this quasi-judicial role, people appearing before them would have to be advised that they have a right to counsel and that any statements they made could be later used against them to their detriment. The commission would also require extensive training and a set of procedural rules to ensure fairness in such proceedings. And you'll hear later on that the commission members want nothing to do with this. We believe that the chief diversity officer under the general advice and policy direction of the commission is better suited to this task. The commission is nearing completion of its first five years and must report on its activities and review its bylaw. We hope and expect that the commission will evaluate the outcomes of its cases and take into consideration the complaints that prompted the petitioner to submit Article 24, complaints that we consider to be valid. Meanwhile, the cautions that were articulated in 2014 about giving a volunteer commission quasi-legal powers remain valid, and there are potentially suitable models elsewhere, and the advisory committee concluded that a moderators committee should review those models. By a vote of 22 to nothing with two abstentions, the advisory committee recommends, recommends referral to a moderators committee and concurs with the motion offered by the Committee on Town Operations and Structure. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nobrega. You have five minutes. Mariah Nobrega, town meeting member, precinct four, and member of the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations, speaking for a majority of the commission, which recommends favorable action on warrant article 24 as amended. CDICR had an extended discussion about this warrant article, which affects our work directly. We were informed by the town HR director, Ann Braga, about the many challenges to implementation and also received um, written guidance or heard written guidance from outside counsel um, with regard to school specific issues to implementation. We took this information very seriously and recognized that there are significant challenges to the implementation, implementation of what is proposed. Members also expressed the view that they did not have the necessary background to effectively carry out the proposed changes and that they might need to resign to ensure that new members could be appointed who did have the necessary background. Although the commissioners recognize these challenges, we also recognize that to vote no action was to accept the town's insufficient current method for dealing with complaints. To vote no is to accept the status quo, and we do not accept the status quo. The CDICR felt that this is an opportunity for those who agree with us that the town is not appropriately and holistically addressing citizen complaints, resident complaints, to vote yes to apply pressure and create a sense of shared urgency. Therefore, the CDICR voted in favor of the warrant article with the amendment that it will not take effect until July 1st, 2021. This allows sufficient time for the town to respond to the planned change and either enact a separate citizen complaint review process, of which there are many models that would replace the proposed bylaw changes, or allow the town and CDICR to plan to exercise this function as written. We did not have the opportunity to convene to consider either of the motions that are also in front of you, which are for referral back to either CDICR or to a moderator's committee. So what I'm going to say next is my own opinion. 
Um, while I believe that both referrals are similar to the spirit of what CDICR voted, there are important differences that make those referrals ultimately less meaningful. With the AC proposal to refer this to a moderator's committee, the CDICR will not have a hand in crafting legislation which directly impacts its own practices. With the select board proposal to refer back to CDICR, there will not be the same urgency to address this problem across town government. The more people who are committed to a 2021 solution, the more likely it is to happen. So I would urge you to vote in favor of the petitioner's motion with the proposed amendment to 2021 to create a shared sense of urgency and to work to change the perception and reality that Brookline does not take public complaints seriously. Please vote no on either referral, referral and favorable action on the warrant article as amended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. And Ms. Brown, would you please come forward and sit in the front row? Five minutes. Well, you didn't ask for it, but uh, I guess you can have it. Okay. I won't use it all, but uh, it's good to know I don't have to rush through. Mr. Moderator, Bernard Green, Chair of the Select Board, speaking for a unanimous Select Board, voting to refer the subject of Warren Article 24 to the Commission on Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. Warren Article 24, in amending Bylaw 3.14, states that the Commission shall receive and investigate complaints, including discrimination complaints, and interview the complainant and witnesses, prepare written findings, and recommend appropriate action to the relevant elected board including the Select Board uh, School Committee and the Library Board, I believe. At the annual town meeting on May 27, 2014, Warren Article 10, the bylaw creating the commission, was passed by a vote of 185 in favor, 18 opposed, and six abstentions. The Select Board voted unanimously for the article and had this to say about including similar language as is proposed in Warren Article 24. And I apologize for boring you with this, but this is important. Some have suggested that the Commission needs more direct involvement and authority in adjudicating claims of discrimination against the town or others. As previously mentioned, we feel strongly that a volunteer appointed body subject to the open meeting law should not be involved in specific matters that implicate complex privacy rights, labor law, or other factors that could compromise the town's interests. Should this commission be assigned this quasi-judicial role, persons appearing before them would have to be advised that they had a right to bring legal counsel and that any statements they made could later be used to their detriment. The commission would also require extensive training and a set of procedural rules to ensure fairness in such proceedings. We believe that the CDO, meaning the Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Jelano, under the general advice and policy direction of the Commission, is better suited for this task. The same concerns and others were raised by the Select Board, or for the Select Board, at its hearing on Warren Article 24 on November 5, 2019. Those additional concerns related to the liability of Commission members serving in such quasi-judicial roles to allegations of ineffective or incomplete investigations or the liability of the select board or other town bodies that don't accept wholesale the recommendations of the commission on a particular matter. <laughs> Human Resources Director Ann Braga described to the select board how investigations as proposed in Warrant Article 24 are highly complex requires hours of dedicated research. She also noted that such investigations implicate intricate intersections of federal and state law and specialized areas of discrimination law and their relationship to education law, disabilities law, labor law, privacy law, and others. She reminded the select board of the significant training required of staff to keep current with changing policy, best practices, and laws concerning how you investigate matters. I find it ironic that the current commission voted favorable action on the article because, as they put it, and as indicated by Ms. Nobrega, 
a no action was to accept the town's insufficient method for dealing with citizens' complaints. I find it ironic because the commission already has methods for dealing with citizen complaints in bylaw 3.14, and they have developed regulations to implement the bylaw that are found on their webpage and that were adopted on May 18, 2016. The Commission's regulations are particularly appropriate for the specific type of complaint that Petitioner cited in his presentation to the Select Board on November 5th. He recounted an experience at a meeting where he felt that individuals were disparaging to Native Americans in the audience, the typical rude and boring behavior that are found in many town meetings. Petitioner felt that his complaint of his experience was not met with sufficient response from the town government or the Diversity Commission. In my view, and I think this reflects the select board, if the Commission's method for dealing with citizens' complaint is insufficient, then that is where we should focus. Dr. Jelano and Ms. Uh, Chief Diversity Officer and Ms. Braga, the Human Relations Director, agreed to work with Petitioner and the Commission to address such insufficiencies and improve the Commission's response to complaints like the experience Petitioner described and others. Petitioner, in fact, agreed to work with them on this. Therefore, on November 5, 2019, the Select Board voted 5-0 to zero for referral to the Commission with instructions to work with the petitioner or his designee and the town's Chief Diversity Officer, Lloyd Jelano, and the town's HR Director, Anna Braga, to tighten up, if necessary, and improve the Commission's regulations that currently address the issues motivating the Warren article and making them more effective for other types of complaints. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Deborah Brown, Precinct One. Um, this Warren article is tricky because you know, part of it deals with individual complaints, but more importantly, it, it, it deals with systemic issues, you know, uh, cultural issues. And I think that as, well, you know, I, I can give you an example. I was going into D DICR one day, and I was met with a, with a gruff, what do you want here? Not how can I help you. What do you want here? Talk about a chilling introduction. You know, and we all, I'm, I'm sure everybody has an example of a way that, that they felt slighted or misused. Uh, you know, but for people of color, it happens every day. The only time it doesn't happen is when I don't leave my house and I don't turn my television on. And, and that's no way to live. And as I think about Arthur's warrant article, I, I have to think about the fact that we don't have a systemic overview in place of, of Dicker. We, we don't have it. It's, a, it's an office that has been poorly staffed since the beginning of time, yet we say, oh, the, that office can do it. Well, it can't. It can't and it hasn't. And part of what we're asking is, oh, to trust the very system that allows a fair amount of these issues to continue to fix it. We don't write warrant articles because we don't have anything to do. We, we, we write warrant articles to fix a problem. You have one minute. Okay. So I'm gonna very quickly was as we talk about we could lose the volunteers on Dicker, that would be a shame. And you may lose some, but there's, there's no shame in training people. There's no shame in saying this is not the perfect fit for me at this point. 
And I would say when you start talking about quasi-jurisdictional, quasi-judicial and training and fairness and you know, personal liability, don't you have the same things with the ZBA? Don't you have the same things with school committee? And, and I'm gonna conclude by saying that if we looked at the wealth disparities in this town, employment, educational, education, criminal justice, housing, and health, we, we have to get to a point where we're asking a basic question. Is the system that we're operating under effective? And I think Arthur's approach, when combined with moving back the start date to 2021, accords us a real opportunity to do the kind of work uh, such that we can begin to eliminate racism rather than accepting it as the norm. Mr. Rosenthal. Um, thank you, uh, Marty Rosenthal, Precinct 9. And I'm here for CTOS's motion, uh, not for PACS, which coincidentally has agreed with us. Um, we took seriously Arthur's concerns, but like the committees I'm going to soon mention, we didn't sort through factual allegations. But perceptions matter. For alleged misconduct, especially by race and gender, we should emulate Caesar's wife and be above suspicion. Ergo, no rest for the wary. I'm a huge commission fan, but we asked Arthur, how does this article interact with our existing procedures? Like, for instance, who complains where? Does shall investigate preempt, for instance, police and school investigation procedures? This is not in a vacuum, and the commission members, staff, and community healer role all seem at odds with judging. Some, maybe all the existing procedures also merit a coordinated study. Some significant ones are, for instance, 1987, I was co-author of the Police and Community Relations Report, one of my proudest accomplishments. 15 pages, single spaced of police proce uh, complaint procedures. We consulted many experts, had three large hearings, and decided that an independent civilian review boards were, and I would say now still are, a near universal failure. So we created that by the select board and urged analogous procedures for all town departments. Then I found out in 2016 that that had been done by the Human Resources Department in 2011, actually, a policy against discrimination, sexual harassment, and retaliation, 10 pages with a more informal appeal process. In 2013, I was on a large committee rewriting the commission bylaw, the one that came to town meeting and passed after adding Pax's amendment, making its director a department head. You have one minute. Thank you. That committee felt the commission should not be investigating, and town meeting agreed. And then there's the school letter, which you all have seen, uh, about their own procedures. I, want another large, I was on another large committee revising police procedures in 2009. They were recently studied by Bobby Nagel and Kelly Race, and I raised questions as to what's happened after that at, at a couple of public hearings. I think there are significant questions. The human resource process seems invisible on the town website, and the commission process is curiously unused. Our motion's phraseology, subject matters, plural. It's legislative history, supplement number two, its composition are all broader than the selectman's motion. And so please join the advisory committee, support the CTOS motion. In fact, the, commission, the commissions and the select board's explanations at pages 24-8 and supplement number one include many of our concerns and you've heard them tonight from Bernard and Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've... Uh, <clears throat> We now uh, come to the voting, and uh, we have before us, as I mentioned originally, a main motion, an amendment, and two motions to refer. We will deal first with the motion to refer to DICR, as supported by Mr. Green and the select board. If that motion passes, then uh, we will not vote on 
the motion for a referral to a moderator's committee. That will become the referral motion and we will vote again on exactly the same motion to refer to DICR as the final referral vote motion. If that motion passes, we will not, uh, we will not vote on the main motion. If it fails, we'll vote first on the Ms. Nobrega's amendment and then on Mr. Conquest's main motion. So uh, the first, yes, Mr. Rosenthal. Well, I th think you might be about to clarify what I was going to ask. Shall I let you do so, or shall I ask? What's that? <laughs> I, I was, was going to try to clarify, and you may have been about to do it, that if anyone prefers the moderator's committee uh, motion, they should vote no action on the selectmen's. That's, that's certainly correct. Right. Thank you. So the first motion we're voting on is the selectman's motion to refer the subject matter of this article to DICR. And uh, are there 35? <coughs> of course there are. So this is a motion to refer to DICR Article 24. Move to refer to DICR. Press 1 if you support the motion to refer to DICR. Press 2 if you oppose it. And press 3 if you are abstaining. Motion fails by a vote of 22 in favor, 130 opposed, and nine abstentions. So the next vote is on the motion of the advisory committee and CTOS to refer the subject matter to a moderator's committee. If that motion passes, we will not vote on the main motion. If it fails, we will then vote on Ms. Nobrega's amendment and then the main motion. So we are voting now on the motion to refer to a moderator's committee. This is, uh, of course, it's, it'll be a recorded vote. Uh, this is a referral to MC. And press one if you favor referral to a moderator's committee, press two if you're opposed, and three if you're abstaining. We'll uh, wait for the 60 second. We're starting over. Is the, is the timer not operating? Okay, one, if you are in favor of a referral to a moderator's committee, two if you're opposed, and three if you're abstaining.
Motion fails by a vote of 76 in favor, 78 opposed, and six abstentions. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if there are any changes to this uh, vote, we need to know about it immediately. And in any case, uh, any changes that you want to make in a recorded vote, uh, you'll have to make before we dissolve the meeting this evening. On the Nobrega amendment to the main motion, which is to strike the last sentence of the motion on uh, page six of the orange supplement and to provide that the amendments set forth in the motion shall be effective on July 1, 2021. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. Motion carries. On the main motion as so amended, those in favor, please raise all right, recorded vote. Uh, are there 35 town meeting members who would like a recorded vote? And there are. So pre uh, this is on the main motion as amended by the Nobrega Amendment. Article 24, main motion. Press one if you favor the main motion, two if you're opposed, and three if you're abstaining. Motion carries by a vote of 109 in favor, 24 opposed, and a whopping 27 abstentions. <clears throat> we turn now to Article 29. The main motion under Article 29 is on page 2 of the Lavender Supplement, number 1, to that article. <clears throat> moved by Mr. O'Neill, seconded by Mr. Fernandez, that the town adopt a resolution urging the select board to allocate 30, up to 35% of the revenues from uh, the local option tax on marijuana, marijuana revenue to uh, racial bring, uh, to bring about racial equality, et cetera, in the words of the motion, about which you will hear more in a moment. The, a substitute motion is offered by Mr. Gordon, seconded by Mr. Sandman on page five of the Lavender suppl Supplement to uh, urge, the town meeting would urge the select board to offer an appropriation for racial equality advancement as part of the town's annual operating budget cycle. That is not a motion to refer. It is a substitute motion for the main motion. If it passes, that we'll uh, then vote on it as the main motion and not get to Mr. O'Neill's motion. Mr. O'Neill, I'll explain that again when, we, when it comes time for a vote. <clears throat> Good evening, Donald O'Neill Sr., 
town meeting member from Precinct 4. So I've never done a PowerPoint before, ever. This is the first time in my 40 years I've been here I've done a PowerPoint, so bear with me. <laughs> um, obviously, you guys know what the warrant article is about. Um, it's asking for up to 35% to go back to the, com to the community. Oh, shoot. All right, so I'm not gonna read all of this, obviously, but I, I want you to see that the funds will be voted on by you all here. Um, the Community Diversity Board and Committee will, will uh, do the programming for it. Business ready projects, this could help a lot. Um, for example, we have a hard time with vouchers. I have a five year old. Um, we have to send our kids, if they accept vouchers, daycares, out to Roxbury or um, somewhere else. So it would be awesome if we can kind of recruit um, already, you know, you know, businesses that are already operating to um, come into town. Funding. So Brookline Housing, I'm from Village Way um, Complex. We have a lot of, some of it's part of Brookline, Ho uh, Brookline Housing Authority, um, part of Section 8. Um, thank God I would not be here if, for that. Um, there's a lot of repairs that need to be done in Brookline Housing. You heard from the housing um, board all, all the issues that we have in town. Um, it's real. They do exist, and um, um, some of these funds could go support that. Uh, this, pro this can also fund community enrichment programs, um, bringing servant on groups to Brookline permanently to reach out to new community members annually in order to ultimately address civic participation, provide grant opportunities for local community organizations that are at the forefront of racial equity, inclusion, and accessibility social justice, and or immigration and refugee work. Obviously establish a fund program in a town designed to alleviate barriers to civic engagement. The town has made the commitment to diversity and inclusion you know, over the last few years from the Gare Warrant article to just um, a lot, I mean, I, I even sat up here in front of this body and played the saxophone <laughs> to get that going. Um, hi, John. <laughs> So we already have this in work. Um, the select board has had um, this on their minds for quite some time now. And, and I just, you know, I wanna see it happen. Um, gotta see what the priorities for the town already include. Right. Um, I just wanna read something. So this, this warrant article is personal to me. Um, I said I've been here 40 years. Um, um, we, marijuana has, has shined an ugly light on a lot of people for many years, and um, for the town to benefit from it and not give back to the people who were hurt by it, it's kind of disrespectful, I feel. I wrote this resolution because deep in my heart, I believe that when President Barack Obama said, we are the change we have been waiting for, that he was right. He was talking about this body right here. Deep in my heart, I truly believe my home sweet home of Brookline, Massachusetts, feels like I feel about the importance of inclusion, equal rights, and supporting the hopes and dreams of everyone, especially the underserved population in Brookline, Mass, in every aspect of the word support. I truly believe that Brookline is committed to help and support those hopes and dreams in any way that we can, so that all who have hopes and dreams of a better life are truly allowed to have those hopes and dreams, and with our help and support, will have a greater opportunity to make it a reality. 
We have a unique opportunity right here and right now to put into practice what we preach, that we're committed to supporting that everyone overcomes, especially the underserved population in town. Right here and right now, by voting yes to Warrant Article 29 at this town meeting, we would be allowing up to 35% of this new marijuana revenue, new revenue that we are so grateful to have to fund programs catered to better the quality of life of, of the underserved population in town. Revenue for marijuana, which was and still is used by the government to destroy the hopes and dreams of a class of people. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, life's most urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Brookline's own JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Well, I'm standing here before this body to tell you that Warrant Article 29 is what Brookline can and should do. Warrant Article 29 gives Brookline the opportunity to, to provide hope to those who only have hope to, to survive. Warrant Article 29 would allow those hopes and goals for so many people who've been trying to overcome and sung that, that gospel song that we shall overcome someday becomes a reality and not just a song. I once read somewhere, as long as we have hope, we have direction, the energy to move, and the map to move by. I also so read somewhere that goals, goals help you overcome short-term problems. Well, I'm here to tell you that I'm from the generation that tru truly believes those words of that song that we shall overcome someday. I'm also from the generation that believes that someday is now. By voting yes, a warrant Article 29, we are sending a strong message to everyone and everywhere that we shall overcome starts here and now in Brookline, Massachusetts. So please support warrant Article 29's the select, the select board's recommendation. Let's, let's see that change really unfold. Let's stop talking about it. Um, please just vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Good evening, Neil Gordon, Precinct 1 Town Meeting Member, speaking on behalf of the Advisory Committee. The Advisory Committee urges the Select Board to offer an appropriation for racial equity advancement as part of the town's annual operating budget cycle. We ask that you vote to do that without an earmark. A bit of Article 29 history. Article 29 was filed by the petitioner to support underserved Brookline residents seeking to establish businesses within and around the town of Brookline. In its original form, it called for raising new funds for this purpose. The current main motion offered by the Select Board calls instead for up to 35% of the town's receipts for marijuana sales tax to be used for unspecified programs administered under the direction of our thinly staffed diversity office with oversight by a thinly supported diversity commission. As the town's finance committee, the advisory committee is wary of articles that present ideas, albeit good ones, which include unfunded mandates and the earmarking of general revenues. Good ideas, including the petitioners, need to be weighed against other good ideas and against our fundamental obligations to educate our children, maintain public safety, provide affordable housing, help our seniors age in place, and more. Projected revenues for marijuana dispensaries were included in planning the 2018 operating override. These projected revenues balance the budget. They do not generate excess funds. With limited funds, when asking for any new programs or project, we need to ask ourselves, instead of what? It's a good question, and it ought to be answered in the budget process. By a vote of 24 to 0, with four abstentions, the Advisory Committee recommends favorable action on a substitute motion. Urge the Select Board to offer an appropriation for racial equity advancement as part of the town's annual operating budget cycle, but do it without the empty promise of an earmark. Thank you. Mr. Fernandez, and there's been a change in the vote on the main motion in Article 24, 109 in favor, 23 opposed, and 28 abstentions. Okay. 
Raul Fernandez speaking as a co-petitioner and for a majority of the select board in favor of Warren Article 29. Most of you received a note from me before the start of town meeting titled, A Progressive Vision of Brookline. It laid out how a commitment to the environment, public education, civic engagement, as well as economic and racial justice are essential elements of my own progressive vision for Brookline, and I hope yours. Now, I haven't spoken very much this session, but I've been there cheering you on as you've done some really big progressive things. From banning fossil fuel infrastructure and new construction, to lowering the voting age to 16, from addressing our school capacity needs to starting the process to make significant investments to address our affordable housing needs. You didn't vote to pay your select board members, but that's fine. <laughs> Honestly, this is the one that I've been waiting for. It's something I started asking questions about after getting elected, but it's town meeting member Donnell O'Neill Sr. who gets the credit for pushing us to make this decision now before it's too late. I know this resolution has gone through some changes, so I want to make clear for you what it does. This resolution asks the select board to budget up to 35% of taxes, not the mitigation funds, but the taxes that are levied on recreational cannabis sales to fund racial equity advancement initiatives. Town meeting would ultimately vote on those requested appropriations. Passage of this article would send a strong message that Brookline understands how unjust marijuana and related laws unfairly targeted communities of color and that we're committed to using these new funds to bring about racial equity. Specifically, it would fund important efforts to close the opportunity gap for students of color, to support the incubation and development of businesses owned by people of color, and to improve the quality of life for Brookline Housing Authority residents, among other potential initiatives. It's important to note that much was promised at the state and local level about how recreational cannabis sales would benefit communities of color. That is yet to be realized statewide or here in Brookline. This is our opportunity to be one of the few communities nationally to make good on that promise. You have one minute. And to do so in a way that benefits generations of current and future Brookline residents. The best part is that a majority of our select board has already voted favorable action on this. With town meeting support, we're ready to move forward and to make it happen. We just need your yes vote. Let's build on the work you've already done in pressing forward on our commitment to the environment, public education, and civic engagement, as well as economic and racial justice to realize a fully progressive vision for Brookline. Please join me and a majority of our select board in voting yes on Warren Article 29. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandman. Mike Sandman, town meeting member of Precinct 3, a member of the advisory committee, uh, speaking for myself and from a little bit of personal experience. Mao Zedong said that, the, that political power <coughs> grows out of the barrel of a gun, but in the US, political power grows out of the barrel of a bank account. If we can promote economic equity for groups of people who've had less, fewer rights, less political power, less respect, they'll have the means to achieve political power and the social equity that comes with that power. Article 29 envisions directing an amount that could reach a million dollars a year to an undefined set of uses, and it's very important to do some defining right from the start. The heart of the petitioner's original article was the creation of an economic development fund to foster economic equity. Uh, there are models for uh, funds of that sort, and I can tell you about one. When I'm not at town meeting, those few days, I mentor startups at the Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation in Upham's Corner. Dorchester Bay is one of the rare lenders who will fund startups as opposed to being a bank that wants three years of profitable uh, business activity before they'll provide a loan. And I do that work as a mentor for an organization some of you may have heard of called SCORE. It's a national organization of 10,000 volunteers. SCORE's 75 mentors in Boston helped people create 419 new businesses in 2018 and 956 non-owner jobs. 60% of our clients were women, 39% were minorities. It takes an, an, an ecosystem 
to help startups and small businesses prosper and grow in that way. The goal in Upham's Corner is to help people get qualified for funding. One component of that ecosystem is money, capital, and Article 29 gives us a route to provide that. Another component, though, is technical support, helping entrepreneurs figure out how much capital they need to get started, something they don't often know how to do without a little bit of help. Mentoring them as they look for funding and working with them once they get started. The advisory committee voted to, rec to make, recommend simplifying Article 29 by recommending to the select board that funds be allocated by the town for racial equity advancement as part of the town's annual budget cycle. We don't need Article 29 to do that. The select board can do it now. We didn't tie this to this appropriation to the flow of funds for marijuana taxes for reasons you'll hear about and reasons that I think you'll find are valid. If the article passes, whatever form it passes in, I ask the Select Board's Small Business Development Committee to start by defining what we as a town hope to accomplish with these funds. You have one minute. And take the time to define the means to those goals. Will Brookline make loans? At what interest rate? Will it make grants? Who will judge applications for the funding? What accountability will recipients have? And who will provide that oversight? Now, we can't wrap that all into a warrant article, and that's not what I'm asking for, but I am asking the select board to pay attention to these questions. Article 29 is a great idea, but the devil is in the details. I urge the select board to prioritize getting those details right, right from the start, and I urge you to vote for the advisory committee's substitute, which is aimed at accomplishing exactly what the petitioner seeks in a much simpler form. Thank you, Ms. Vanderzeel and Ms. Kahn. Would you please come forward? So, Kaya Vanderzeel, town meeting member from Precinct. Um, 15 and a member of the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. I'm speaking on behalf of a unanimous um, Commission uh, for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations uh, in support of the petitioner's warrant article. Now, these comments were written before some changes were made, so I'll try to make it uh, useful and short. Um, so the commission was presented with a slightly different version of this that, that had the percentage at 35%, but otherwise pretty much the same as what the select board's motion is, and my understanding is that that is what the petitioner uh, is also in favor of. Um, and uh, that it, it in, and the, the inclusion of the resolve that this would be administered by the Office uh, of Diversity, et cetera, and uh, with input from the commission. Um, so we are not alone if we do this. I don't know how many of you have been following this sort of thing, but Evanston, Illinois, who has an alderman form of government, um, just voted eight to one to earmark all of their marijuana revenue, uh, <laughs> recreational marijuana, or cannabis becomes legal there January 1st of 2020. All of their, they're, they're earmarking it all for what they are calling reparations. Um, what form these reparations will take has not been uh, promulgated yet, but the idea is that these, these funds will be used much the same way as this uh, racial equity or economic equity advancement a fund is purported to to work um, so so and I want to say one other thing it's not just about the racial disparities uh, in the enforcement of drug enforcement laws you have one minute that, thank you that is only the one of the most recent uh, um, inequities involved in race in this town so I urge you to agree with the commission and vote yes on the warrant article as put forward by the select board and the petitioner. Thank you. Ms. Kahn and Ms. Noya Fine, would you come forward, please? 
We'll hear from two more speakers after Ms. Khan, and then we'll take questions from the floor. Janice Khan, town meeting member from Precinct 15, um, and I'm speaking to urge town meeting to vote for the um, advisory committee's substitute language on warrant article 21 for one simple reason. According to state law, all revenue from the marijuana local option excise tax has to go into the general fund and then go through a budgetary process of appropriation. It cannot be set aside for any specific purpose. Again, that's the law. And the advisory committee language more clearly conforms to the law. So both versions, um, no ma both versions are voting yes for this article. Both versions support um, a consideration of these monies, of, of funding for um, this very worthy purpose. So what triggered my research into Article 29 was a document. In the select board's packet for October 15th, I found a local finance opinion dated September 24th, 2018, that was labeled Article 29 Backup. The document provided guidance for the municipal finance law regarding the disposition of marijuana local option excise tax monies. And I assumed the document supported the select board's intention to allocate the monies for that particular purpose. But when I read the opinion, it seemed to do just the opposite. So I called the Department of Revenue's Bureau of Municipal Finance Law, which had issued the guidance for clarity. And here's what I discovered. The law governing the disposition of those funds is very specific. All of the local option tax monies for marijuana retail sales has to go into the general fund. It cannot be earmarked prior to going through the regular process of appropriation. I spoke to the attorney of the day, John Gannon, who explained the legal requirements of that money. I read him both the select board's language and the advisory committee's language. He found the select board's language to be too fuzzy, unclear. In his opinion, the select board language gives the impression that one could allocate these monies for a specific purpose, in this case, using up to 35% of those revenues. You have one minute. Thank you. Um, which is not allowed under the law. On the other hand, in his legal opinion, the language of the advisory committee, which also prioritizes an appropriation for racial equity advancement as part of the annual operating budget cycle, but does not specifically mention any source of funding, is clearly in compliance with the law governing the disposition of the marijuana revenues. Item five of the local finance opinion lays this out very clearly to the question of whether there are any exceptions to the general rule related to marijuana funds, the answer is no. It then states, the money belongs to the general fund and can only be spent by appropriation. And that's General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53. As a legislative body, clarity in the language of warrant articles is important. Therefore, please vote favorable action on the advisory committee's substitute language for warrant article 29. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Neufeind. And Ms. Mr. Sainer, would you come forward, please? Yeah, we'll get to you, Ms. Brown, don't worry. Good evening, I'm Bettina Neuefeind. I'm a town meeting member for Precinct 1. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me, when I first read this, um, the main motion, I was struck immediately by the appropriateness of linking the proceeds of the legalized marijuana specifically to racial equity programs. Um, and I just wanted to make a couple of um, points uh, underscoring that. I'm sure a lot of you saw the article in the New York Times this week um, breaking down in, in great bold letters uh, the ongoing racism in banking uh, that happens all over this country and uh, I think in, in mainstream banking, access to money is still filtered by race um, every single day and I'm sure that that is true for small business owners in Brookline no less than anywhere else. Um, also, it is primarily communities of color that were decimated through the war on drugs perpetrated for decades in this country. I was a law clerk in a federal district court where we spent Fridays um, in the late 90s doing sentencing hearings. And at these sentencing hearings of these 18, 19, 20 year old kids who were highly motivated, highly organized, extremely hardworking, 
and very effective at supporting their entire communities, their churches, their families, through the only business opportunities that were available to them. This was in West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, those were all the communities of color. And the disparities that sort of get passed on through generations are persistent. And even though the war on drugs in theory has ended, the repercussions continue. And I think now that marijuana has been legalized, I think it would just be perverse to allow the people to profit from it um, who did not suffer disproportionately from it. So um, I appreciate Ms. Khan's attention to detail, um, and, and I trust that the ear mark will be conducted in, in whatever fashion is legally required, but I do think the link um, is absolutely appropriate, um, and I hope that you will support the main motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sainer. Good evening. Paul Sainer, I'm a member of the Brookline Fiscal Advisory Committee. I co-chair EDAP, but I'm speaking this evening as a Precinct 13 town meeting member. Uh, Mr. Fernandez suggested last night that we begin an adult conversation around the town's finances. Unless you believe that the uh, taxpayers have a limitless appetite for overrides, we're broke. Let me explain. The town administrator's financial forecast shows that our maintenance only operating expenses are going up annually at a rate of 4.3%, whereas our revenues are going up by 2.8%. That is, um, in terms of dollars, uh, several million dollars of a funding gap immediately growing to more than $22 million in the year 24. So how do you resolve that? With more revenues? Well, those options beyond the obvious marijuana revenue are rather limited, or you try to control expenses. The townside budget has been austere for many years. You all got an email recently from the uh, interim superintendent showing that there's a funding gap in this fiscal year considerable on the school side that's not part of the town administrator's long-term forecast. Pam Katz uh, sent an email to town meeting a week or so ago, and I want to quote, Every single action town meeting takes makes it more expensive to live in Brookline. I agree with that, and uh, this is just one of many examples that makes the town administrator's job very, very difficult towards balancing our budget. The, um, many in town have to rely on savings in order to stay in town. You have one minute. The town does not have that luxury. It has... Um, as we stand today, uh, reserves that don't meet our minimum policy, uh, reserves that um, are at the single A level, and this town's AAA rating for reserves were 13th out of 13. Uh, BFAC has created an integrated uh, forecasting model predicting uh, quite quantifiably Moody's credit rating, and as you lay on debt, our credit rating will drop to double uh, A. There was reference uh, last night to Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville in the transfer tax discussion. Um, I want to point out that um, our commercial tax base in relation to those communities is a pittance in relation, but more importantly, we have no organic opportunities for commercial growth. Linda Pelkey uh, showed um, uh, 1285 Beacon Street for the Article 15 debate. I want to point out that that, in my 25 years involved with economic development, is the only uh, development of any commercial size that's proceeded without a zoning change. So I um, urge you to vote in favor of uh, the advisory motion. And if I could take just one second, uh, Professor Toffel, um, sent you all an email about BFAC's upcoming public hearing a week from tonight. 
Uh, we'll re-post uh, that. I encourage all of you uh, to come to that hearing, to listen to our preliminary recommendations, give us feedback, and as the financial stewards of this town that passes our annual budget, study up on our financial condition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Brown. We're going to hear from Ms. Brown, and then we're going to have some questions from the floor. Deborah Brown, Precinct 1. Uh, I'm going to quote from a letter from a Birmingham jail. And it goes, my friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. Lamentably, it is a historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture, but as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. We know that through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was not well, that was well timed, that was well timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the <coughs> disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We, we went from slavery to Jim Crow, separate but equal, hell, the GI Bill, the, the New Deal, all, all of these great experiences have left us with very little. You have one minute. And if you don't think that sting sticks, you're sadly mistaken. There are scientists now that talk about epigenetics. It's if you suffer enough, it becomes part of your DNA. This 35% is a relatively small pot when you think about what a sizable number of people in Brookline, in particular, people of color in Brookline have suffered. And for those reasons, I would ask that you support the Warren article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Hi, Paul Warren, uh, Precinct 1. Mr. Moderator, Cannabis Control Commission uh, is, states that it's committed to implementing a variety of programs to actively engage people from communities disproportionately impacted uh, by the war on drugs and seeking to include them in the legal cannabis industry. In Brookline, our zoning policies have effectively turned over our cannabis industry to large, vertically integrated, highly capital capitalized corporations. Uh, the, the opportunities for small, minority-owned and underrepresented groups to participate directly in Brookline's cannabis opportunities are all but impossible. When Donnell approached me about a month and a half ago about his challenges with this Warren article, going after additional 3%, uh, I said, why not go after the existing 3%? And he said, well, you know, I'm hearing things like, now's not the time. Uh, if, if you ask for this money, you're not going to be able to get it, and it's already been earmarked for other things. I'd just like to ask my own question, and this is my question. If not now, when? If you, re if you approve the refer motion uh, to the general budget, you're basically saying get back in line. And uh, I think it's... It, the question is, when are we going to start delivering on the promise? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vitolo. Tommy Vitolo, town meeting member at large. Mr. Moderator, like climate change, racial inequity are a multi-generational problem that will cost real money to uh, begin to unwind, and I believe it's money well spent. I do have a question, and that is that the select board motion calls for not 35%, but up to 35%. Uh, 
and it seems to me that the select board and the advisory committee have different opinions about how much money we ought to spend. My question is, in the budget process, how do we figure out, uh, for next year's budget, do we end up nearer 0%, nearer 35%, or somewhere in the middle? What does that process look like? I suppose that's something the Board of Selectmen is going to have to decide, Mr. Fernandez. <coughs> So we actually debated whether or not to include a number or not uh, during um, during our conversation about this Warren article, uh, and and what folks who uh, voted for it and voted against it agreed is that putting a number on there actually sets an expectation, uh, and so the 35 percent is think of it as a cap, so it can go no higher than 35 percent. Uh, another thing I want to clear up here because I think this matters too is that. Um, this is not necessarily, necessarily an earmark. What it does is it provides guidance, guidance to the select board to submit an appropriation to this body, which is essentially equivalent to 35% of the local option tax on recreational cannabis, meaning that we have a sense of exactly how much we should be appropriating each year, looking at uh, how that, that local option tax may increase or uh, in some cases decrease. And so it provides us with that particular guidance. Thank you, Mr. Karen. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Caron, town meeting member, Precinct 12, also former member of the school committee and the advisory committee, so I've done a little bit of work on budgets back when I was active. And um, I have a two-part question. Uh, the first is there's been talk about 35% of the local option tax. Right now we have one marijuana dispensary online. We're soon going to have a second. I believe we're going to have two more over on Commonwealth Avenue. So. First rule of budgeting is how much money are we talking? Presently, how much roughly would 35% of that be? And when everything comes online, potentially what do we anticipate it to be? And then the second part of my question is, uh, and I apologize if this is in the combined reports and I missed it, uh, the local option, mo the money we get from the cannabis facilities from our tax, is that subject to the town school split? So for example, if you're taking a million in revenue is 50% of that going to go to the schools, so you've got 50% left to the town, 35% goes to this purpose, and 15% of it's left for any other town purpose. I just want to clarify, what, you know, what's the money we're talking about and where's it going to go? Has anyone uh, done a rough calculation, Mr. Kleckner? Hi, <clears throat> good evening, Mel Kleckner, town administrator. So. Uh, it's my unenviable job to uh, try to put together a balanced budget, uh, given the, uh, the uh, constrained revenues that we do have. It's a zero-sum game for us. Uh, but to answer your question, um, you know, we're, we're still working and trying to figure out, um, project the amount of revenue for, for next year, uh, for next year's budget. We have not uh, concluded that process. Um, hard to say, you know, we, we take into consideration how many, uh, um, uh, establishments will be open next year. Um, we had a vaping ban, and um, we're kind of looking at that and seeing how that affects um, revenues. But you know, I, I think we're going to be probably in the you know average about one one and a half million perhaps for next year. Um, so thirty five percent of that is um, whatever whatever that amount is. I don't have uh, that okay. handy. But uh, what, what okay. other questions okay. do you have? Then secondly, if all four of the dispensaries come online, do we have any sort of projection about what that money would no, be like? I, I mean, it would be four really times the one point. Uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. I, you know, not, not all establishments are at the same scale. Okay. So then then I guess the other, the other part is when the money comes in, is that pot subject to essentially a town school partnership? So roughly sure. half is going to the schools and no. then 50% stays sure, for town side needs. Yes. Okay, and yes, so it's this a general, rev general revenue. General revenue is uh, is what goes into the pie get, that gets okay. split up. So, so as a practical matter, for non-school town purposes, if 35% is allocated to this particular purpose, there's 15% left for you to figure out how to spread around to help you balance the budget. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Kleckner. Thank you, Mr. Thank Moderator. you, Ms. Silva. Yeah. So, uh, Kate Silva, town meeting member, precinct one. Um, there, are, I know people know this, but there are as many people uh, of color today under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system as there ever were enslaved people in this country, and the reason is cannabis. So the injustice that's been done is 
grave and of enormous dimensions. But I want to talk about commercial cannabis for a moment because while the world was concerned slightly about that equity issue, commercial cannabis galloped around us, not just this town, but the whole country. It, it is an entirely hedge fund driven, enormous corporate operation, it has nothing to do with equity, and the efforts that people have made, both at the state level and at this town level, have been completely faint. Especially here in Brookline, we really exemplify that because we have the most profitable cannabis operation in town, we're about to, in, in the country, we're about to open the third most profitable one in the state. Enormous amount of money. The one that's opened is owned by a billionaire with a B, not an equity operation. Um, a couple of weeks ago, in this town, you voted to refer to a moderator's committee study of why Brookline is not well designed for equity applicants because our zoning is totally out of whack with everyone else in the state. 10,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet. This is only going to be attractive to enormous corporate operations. We will never have an equity operation here. Now, Ms. Silva, you voted for it right before you voted against it because we overturned that vote. This has to be done. The situation in Brookline is appalling in terms of racial equity on this issue. I urge you to vote favorable action on Donnell's warrant article and not on the referral. There's, uh, let's, let's be clear about two things. Uh, as far as I know, there was no referral to a moderator's committee under STM 3, if there was, it Not yet. comes as a great surprise to me. Uh, <clears throat> we made that vote, and then we overturned that right. vote. Se secondly, uh, the motion of the advisory committee is not a referral motion. It's a motion simply to uh, urge the selectmen to budget for this purpose. Ms. Mautner? Rebecca Plout Mautner, town meeting member from Precinct 11. My question is really, as it turns out, a follow-up on Mr. Karen's to understand the numbers behind this a little bit better. Um, and I just want to understand if the revenue right now is about 1.5 million, and to make the math easy for all of us, I'm going to assume it will go up a little bit with the new enterprises, perhaps to 2 million, and then it's much easier to do the math, and it may actually be realistic. Uh, if half is going to the schools, so say a million's going to the school, so I want to understand how this works. So. It's 35% of the total, so that would mean, if I heard before, that would mean 15% of the total would be left for general operations, which would mean if we have about 2 million, that about 300 to 350,000 would be left for general operations, and about um, $700,000 under this proposal would be going to racial equity. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I'm wondering if the advisory committee in uh, discussing uh, just putting a racial equity advancement fund in the budget talked about the dollar value that you would see if th that that would be appropriate so we could understand that relative to this dollar amount. Mr. Sandman. Mike Sandman speaking to the advisory committee. Uh, no, we didn't try to do that any more, quite honestly, than the select board has. Uh, and um, we recognize that whatever is done needs to be large enough to have an impact on the one hand and yet recognize the other demands uh, for funds that, that we face. Um, that is the, the truth of the matter is uh, whenever you're uh, budgeting with a limited, with a cap on the amount of money coming in, you have to make judgments as to what's important what's primarily important, what's secondarily important. We have not attempted to make that judgment, and we would rely on the select board to ask us uh, by putting together a budget um, for a specific amount, but uh, no, we haven't done what you've asked. Mr. Levy. Hi, I'm Mark Levy, town meeting member, Precinct 7. 
And I agree with the advisory committee that their motion is fiscally and legally the equivalent of what's being proposed uh, by uh, Article 29. But there's one big difference. That is, Article 29 has whereas as clauses, and it is framed in terms of racial equity. Now, if I'm in a slim year of, of budgets, uh, so that we can decide they can only go to an amount which is the equivalent of 10% of the re marijuana revenue, they're free to do so under this. They can ignore it entirely, it's a resolution. But it's a statement of town meeting of what we think is important, what we think are important in priority. And using the language of the resolution, I think makes it clear to everyone, not only in this hall, but anybody who's interested, anybody in the other towns who are interested, that we take this sort of uh, development of underserved people very, very seriously. Uh, it's not simply racially underserved or racial groups, but any identified class of people who are, who are underserved could be benefited by this program. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize that this is a bind, a non, every, either version is a non-binding resolution in effect. It's up to the selectmen to make the final decision on what they're gonna propose. It's up to the advisory committee to make the final decision on what they're gonna recommend. And it's up to town meeting in the end to set what the different budgets will be. But I think it's important for us as a town and us as a, a town that's committed to equity uh, that we use the language of the Article 29 and uh, go from there because that's the clearest expression if this is in fact town meetings will of what town meetings will is. Thank you. Mr. Sandman. Uh, Mike Sandman for the Advisory Committee. Um, Mr. Levy, you're mistaken in saying that the Advisory Committee did not include um, reference to a racial equity advancement. Uh, the resolve is town meeting urged the select board to offer an appropriation for racial equity advancement as part of the town's annual budget si operating budget cycle. Thank you. I, you are certainly correct, but also you don't include reasons which the uh, Motion does. I think you've made your point, Mr. Levy. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, Mike Toffel, Precinct 8. Um, um, I'm uh, also a member of the Brookline Fiscal Advisory Committee w along with Paul Sainer. Um, and I want to reflect a little bit on what I've learned there in the context of this conversation and then end with a question. So I've learned there that we've been balancing our budget over the past few years by draining our reserves. That's a version of what Paul Sainer says when he says we're broke. So I didn't know that, and I don't know how many of you know that, because it was actually hard to get those numbers together, but we've taken the time to get those numbers together. I've also learned that there's three ways to generate revenues. There's fees, there's new development, and there's overrides. So when some say that there's that these fees have already been thought about in the budget, that is true. And so if you wanna allocate fees to other sources, that's fine, but recognize that then we need to either generate new fees, new development, or new overrides. They're, they're, those are the choices that we face. So I don't like earmarks in Washington, and I don't really think managing by earmarks is a good idea here in Brookline either. Um, I certainly support the objectives of this petition, but I also support excellent schools. I also support excellent resources in our town, like parks and roads and services for seniors. And we need to think about what those trade-offs are. And one of the reasons we elect a select board is to help us think through those trade-offs in the budgeting process. So my question is, what is broken about our budgeting process that the majority of the select board is asking us to tell them what they should prioritize? Like, why don't they prioritize it? So I don't understand why select board is in favor of us endorsing a quasi earmark. So that's a question to the select board. Hello, Mr. Fer Fernandez. 
Mr. Green. I think this answers your question. I mean, we've set up a process, or we've proposed a process, whereby the uh, diversity, inclusion, and community, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, let <laughs> one of my minor problems. Um, the process would be to have the commission sit down and come up with proposals to be funded by the select board. So we're looking at a process whereby we're not just saying <laughs> let's fund equity. Uh, we're looking at a process that, that w where the commission looks at what the options are, what will work and what will, won't work, what is feasible now, what is feasible over a period of time, and present those ideas, initiatives to the select board for funding. So I mean, that's, that's the process that we're looking at to ensure that uh, what we fund is effective. And it's very easy to fund programs and initiatives that, that may not turn out to be what we expected, but we want to make sure that uh, we actually address the problems um, and, and, and the issues that uh, we're, we're concerned with. So. so those are all worthy objectives, but my specific question is what's broken about the, the budgeting process that doesn't allow you to do that right now? We could do that right now, and, so and why we should. Are we, why are we being asked to vote on this Warren article then? Well, we haven't done it. So what's wrong with the budgeting process that hasn't allowed you to do it? Well, there's nothing wrong with the process in general. The, the problem is the uh, availability of, of uh, money uh, for the various pr uses that we need the money for um, and having to juggle those various interests, um, and that's very difficult. Uh, we're under pressure to do it now, and we will. Thank you. Ms. Friedman? Sure, Mr. Fernandez. Uh, I just wanted to add also, this is why the number is so very important. What you're able to do is, if you, if you vote favorably on, on the select board's version of it, is you're actually giving us some guidance, some direction to say, yes, come back. Come see us in May. Come see us in November. Come back. And, and the expectation is that we'll be providing an appropriation, a set of appropriation, up to that 35% equivalent to the amount that's coming in. This is why the number is so important. Otherwise, I, I think what you're asking is if, you're, you know, if you go with the advisory committee's version, I think you're absolutely right. It makes no sense for us to be here just to, to say we're going to come forward with an appropriation sometime soon. The number is what's important here. Ms. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paula Friedman, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 14. Mr. Moderator, I wonder if the Town Administrator can address the question of, hasn't this money already been accounted for in the general override that we passed last year? Mr. Kleckner. Hello, uh, Mel Kleckner. Uh, so we passed a, uh, an override, and as part of that override two years ago, um, we developed a three-year plan that was to guide the uh, parameters of this override. And as part of that plan, we committed to raise uh, a little over $2 million in non-tax revenue. Um, there was no um, specific source for that. Um, and uh, we are, I'm intending to, uh, to meet that commitment, but uh, there was no specific recommendations of where that money would come from. So it has not already been spent um, only this town meeting can appropriate money. Um, there, are, there are, as I think Mr. Toffel uh, said, there are only a, a few places that you know, can generate that kind of level of money. We talked about marijuana for sure. We, ta we, we talk about tr the trash uh, fee. We talk about uh, um, uh, parking meter revenue. Uh, those are the big ones. But um, never mind. <laughs> Point of uh, order, Mr. Moderator. Uh, as chair of the select board at the time, and as probably uh, the primary architect of the uh, uh, override funding plan, or one of the architects, uh, I will uh, assure you that uh, the marijuana money was an integral piece of uh, the override funding plan. And if we divert pieces of it, it, it can upset that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, at the point at which I'm not sure that uh, uh, everything 
about this article that uh, can be said has already been said. It's, it's quite, with the, <coughs> the important question I'll uh, allow that question. motion. Is there a second? All those in questions. favor of terminating debate, you, I have no, no further, uh, uh, nobody else has signed up to speak. You see who's at the microphones. Please raise your hand if you want to call the question. Uh, those opposed, that motion loses, so on we go, Ms. Roberts. Thank you, your, uh, Mr. Moderator. I have a question which is if the select board's um, motion is granted and we have a situation where we've been told tonight it very clearly that earmarking is illegal, what would be the effect of that? And I'm wondering whether it would be a good idea for a town meeting to vote that if in fact ultimately it does prove to be illegal, we should just go with the advisory committee's uh, recommendation and having been on the advisory committee, I generally agree with them in any case, but that seems to make some better sense because something could happen sooner rather than later if in fact there's any contest about the Ill illegality of the earmark. Well, I think you've heard arguments on both sides of that uh, that question. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we actually had an answer as to well, what Mr. would happen. Well, Mr. O'Neill, would you? Uh, so, Donald O'Neill, town meeting member, precinct four. The city of Boston has already put one million dollars aside for this fund. Exactly. So, if I don't think, I, I would like for. <laughs> off to try to say it's going on this, but I, we've done so much revising of this warrant article to get the language correct on all sorts of levels. Mr. Moderator knows for sure, Mel knows, that we, I, I hear what Ms. Khan has said, but I disagree with her. Um, if that was the case, I don't think the city of Boston would be doing it right now. Yes, town council, please. Thank you, good evening, Jocelyn Murphy. Um, I, don't, I don't read it as an earmark. I think Mr. Fernandez said it was not an earmark. I read the language um, is what it says, up to 35%. The critical point is that uh, Ms. Khan is correct. There is uh, state municipal finance law requires that the revenue from the tax go into the general fund and then for this body to appropriate a sum. Um, to further or advance racial equity. I don't see an issue with it. It's a resolution article. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Linda Roseman, Precinct 14. I have kind of a nuts and bolts question about the disbursement of these funds and wh how, who decides who gets them. Like, who oversees this? Do people come and apply for these funds? Ha and, you know, will it, will it be like a grant application? And if so, who will decide who gets those grants? And in terms of coming up with programming, who comes up with that programming? Is the, is the DICR, is it individuals who come f and ask for those monies? And who gives them out? And then afterwards, who follows up on how they're being spent? Mr. Fernandez. Raul Fernandez, Select Board. Uh, so what this, do, what this article does, it does empower the, um, the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations to put together a process. Uh, one of the things I remember talking about before, um, uh, although not here, is that um, think about the, the process the Transportation Department goes through with the TNC funds, those, those are the Uber and Lyft funds, uh, and there is a process why, by, whereby they work through to figure out what some potential um, projects may be. They bring those forward for the, to the select board. The select board says these look like really good projects, and then it comes to town meeting ultimately to be appropriated. We just did that. Um, it feels like forever ago, but on the first <laughs> night of town meeting, uh, we did that with those funds. Uh, and so, so you can imagine a process very similar to that, one that we know already works. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Kate Becker, Precinct 3. Um, we heard earlier that because of the 50-50 split between town and school, this proposal would leave only 15% um, for the t of the revenue for the town. But I'm curious um, to get some clarity on whether money from the fund could in fact go to school programs and how that would shift that math. And if so, could it go toward existing school programs, perhaps that were under threat due to tightening budgets, or would it have to go to new programs? Can I just put the slide back on? It's on the slide. 
No, uh, we'll, let's, ha let's try to have an answer from the select board. Mr. Fernandez. Ms. Goff. Melissa Goff, Deputy Town Administrator. So um, I, I think part of the issue is that the, the uh, resolution doesn't have a clear definition of what kinds of programs would be, th these funds would be used for. So I if the resolution would go forward, we need to set up a process to define what would be eligible for these funds and then we would then seek town meetings of appropriation. Thank you, Mr. Karen. Yes, I have a question for uh, Mr. Fernandez. Now, Mr. Green, a few minutes ago, in response to a question about why the board, the select board hasn't done this already, said quite appropriately, and I'm paraphrasing, I apologize to Mr. Green, but essentially budgets are tough. These days you're always taking a bunch of very important competing goals and programs and trying to figure out which ones you cut and which ones you can fund and how best to do it. I don't think I said it as eloquently as he did, but I hope I caught, I hope I caught the gist of it. Now, Mr. Fernandez tells us that the number, that the importance in this article is that the number, that 35% number, is important. I think that was a direct quote uh, from you. And my question is this. How can we, as town meeting, judge whether that 35% number is correct and appropriate without any idea of the competing programs and trade-offs and things that we can't pay for or may not be able to pay for if we do the 35 percent because customarily what we do is we have a budget cycle the board of selectmen proposes with the assistance and actually the driving force of the town administrator how to make those really tough trade-offs and then we in town meeting in the spring come in after the advisory committee reviews it and figure out what makes sense now I just want to know, and I mean this with the utmost respect because this is clearly a very important, very well-intentioned, very good idea for us to do, not necessarily specific funding levels, but to address this. But again, I would ask Mr. Fernandez, how can we as town meeting judge whether or not the 35% is the right number in the absence of all that other information about what we can't do if we do the 35% for this? Well, you understand that the motion is for up to 35%. I want to know if the number is important, how are we going to judge the number in a vacuum? Mr. Fernandez. Uh, the answer is that you won't judge it in a vacuum. Um, you will be presented with the, with the entire budget. I mean, this is, uh, you know this well, um, this will not happen in the dark. The select board uh, with town staff will look at the town budget um, Figure out if 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 necessary where ne where resources needed to, more resources need to be allocated or less resources need to be allocated This happens every year. This is not new um, The fact that that we are saying I mean we know for instance that there's a certain amount of money that goes to the police department every year Right now that's not specifically earmarked for the police department But certainly we're not going to go from from about uh, you know the 19 million a year that goes to the police department now to to 10 a year are we right and so you know, the select board is going to look at the budget, is going to make some thoughtful recommendations. Um, and what we did is we set a cap at 35, no minimum. Um, the AC is going to look at this very clearly. They're going to tear it apart. Uh, and then it's going to go to town <laughs> meeting. And then ultimately town meeting is going to decide. I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to get in the back and forth. No. You've, you've asked, no, I'm sorry. You've asked the question and I've responded. This is your second time at the mic. Okay? Thank I don't want to get in back Mr. and forth. What I want to say here is that that this is, excuse me, that this is, the, the, excuse me, this is not a process that will be happening in the dark. Um, this is a process that is very public, that has many public hearings and meetings, including at the select board, AC, and ultimately town meeting. Thank you, Mr. Toffel. Mike Toffel. Well, we'll, well, I've called on Mr. Toffel, so we'll hear from him before the question's called. Thank you. I apologize for asking a second question. Mike Toffel, town meeting members, precinct eight. I'd like to know whether the select board has plans to ask town meeting for other categories of guidance. Is this going to be the new way that they think about budgeting? Thank you. Well, I sort of think that's a rhetorical question, Mr. Toffel. Well, 
I, I understand your interpretation, and that's a very fair interpretation, but it's not actually what I intended. I did actually mean to intend, are there other categories beyond this particular slice of the cannabis taxes that they're going to be seeking town meeting guidance for quasi earmarks for other expenditures <coughs> as a different way of doing budgeting? I don't think that's how the budget process is going to work. Uh, there was a motion for the question. Is there a second? Is there, is All those in favor of calling the question terminating debate, please raise your hands. Those opposed, motion carries by a two-thirds vote. We vote first on the advisory committee's motion to, yes, we can have a recorded vote that uh, town meeting urged the select board to offer an appropriation for racial equity advancement as part of the town's annual operating budget cycle. This is uh, Article 29, substitute motion. If you vote in favor of this, it becomes the main motion, and uh, you'll never get to the motion on page two of, the, no, of Mr. O'Neill's motion. Is everyone clear about that? No. Okay. We are voting on the advisory committee's substitute motion. If you vote in favor of it, that becomes the main motion and we'll vote again on exactly the same motion. If you vote against it, then and only then will we get to Mr. O'Neill's main motion. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Thank you. Okay, on the... This is Article 29, Substitute Motion. <coughs> Press 1 if you favor the Advisory Committee's motion on 2 if you oppose it and 3 if you abstain. That motion fails by a vote of 76 in favor, 90 opposed, and four abstentions. On the main motion, on page two of supplement number one, the lav lavender supplement, uh, is there, sure. Uh, yes, we'll have a main, uh, this is article 29, main motion, recorded vote. Press one if you favor the Main motion, press two if you oppose it, and three if you abstain. Motion carries by a vote of 127 in favor, 15 opposed, and 29 abstentions. <laughs> Article 30. The main motion under Article 30 is a motion in the words of the article, as, a, as a, I'll get to some wording changes, but uh, it's moved by Ms. Brown, seconded by Ms. Nobrega, and uh, 
to uh, create a Brookline Community Engagement Plan. Now, on the article on page 30-1, which is the main motion, uh, please strike the words to see if the town will vote and substitute the word voted. So it reads, voted to create a new article, and it'll be numbered by the town clerk appropriately. And uh, on page 10-2, at the end of the article, strike the words or act on anything relative thereto. That's how you convert an article to a motion. The, uh, <clears throat> there's a motion to refer on page 30-6. The motion is made by Ms. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Green, to refer the subject matter of Article 30 to the S Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations to create, for the commission to create a draft uh, community engagement plan, et cetera. Uh, Ms. Brown. And Ms. Carroll, you two come forward, please. Uh, good evening again. Uh, I think this is the last time you'll see me for another six months. My name is Deborah Brown. Uh, I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 1. And I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, community engagement. Community engagement is the process of working collaboratively with and through groups of people affiliated by geographic proximity, special interest, or similar situations to address issues affecting the well-being of those people. It is a powerful vehicle for bringing about changes that will improve the health, of a health and well-being of a community and its members. It often involves partnerships and collaborations that help mobilize resources and influence systems, change relationships among partners, and serve as catalysts for changing policies, programs, and practices. That's a lot of words, but at its essence, it means that you create a formalized mechanism to do business with one another. Now, why, do, why does it matter? Well, one of the things that I think about when I think about community engagement is the goals. And it's to increase the likelihood that projects, you know, end on time. That they're widely accepted. Uh, it, it creates more effective solutions if you have more people and diverse people sitting in, around the table. It's to improve citizens' knowledge and skills and, you know, problem solving and, and learn more about issues in depth. It, it, it empowers and integrates people from different backgrounds. And we've talked a fair amount about that tonight just in terms of different backgrounds. Uh, you, you create local networks of community members uh, and you also increase the trust that people have for government. And so when we I'll tell you very quickly what, what motivated me to begin this warrant article was because, you know, I would sit somewhere and I'd say, well, what was the community engagement? And part of what I began to understand was that the town typically goes to the usual suspects. And then I realized, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, I mean that in the sense that people go where they feel most comfortable with people. Now, one of the things you're going to hear tonight is that community engagement is really difficult. Some of you have these little cards that I passed around. This, this is how straightforward community engagement can be. And I would also like to say that not only can it be relatively straightforward, but that it's nothing new. We, not, we as town meeting members may not know a whole heck of a lot about it, but, but if, I, if I talk to the folks in the economic development office here, or planning and economic development, they're going to tell you point blank, yeah, we do community engagement. 
If you talk to the public works people, they're gonna say, oh yeah, we do some community engagement. The problem is no one does it really well. And part of what this Warren article, the expectation is that we up the game level of folks by creating an expectation. Now, I, I got to this point after asking uh, DICR people, where, where is your community engagement model? You and have they, one, one more minute. And they said that they didn't have one. And so I'm gonna give some examples of what happens when we get it right and when we get it wrong. Netta, we got it wrong. We got it wrong. The community engagement, had we done it right, you would not have had people up in arms. I went to a, 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 a select board meeting in uh, August of this year, and uh, one of the marijuana shops came up, and there were maybe five people from the community. And I thought to myself, why are you having a community meet? Why are you discussing this when the community's not here? And more than one person said it's August. People are on vacation. It doesn't do us any good when select board sends out a notice saying on a Friday for a Tuesday, here's a ream of material that you should, you should absorb. Please conclude, Ms. Brown. I will conclude, thank you. We did it right with the climate change discussion. We did it right with the climate change discussion. And there are a lot of times when we get it right, but it's not consistent. That doesn't and sound like a conclusion to me. Please conclude. You have five minutes. Your five minutes is up. Thank you. In conclusion, <laughs> this is gonna save this town money. It's gonna save this town a heck of a lot of embarrassment. It's gonna motivate more people to get engaged. This town will less look like a secret society or a club. I encourage you, this is the least that we can do. There are more professionals in this room that use community engagement, I suspect, than do not. Vote for Warren Article 30, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Carol Carroll, uh, town meeting member, precinct 10, speaking for the advisory committee. Warrant Article 30, presented by the petitioners proposed, is amending the general bylaws. It would create a new article to establish a community engagement plan. After a very careful review, the advisory committee has, has concluded that at this point there is not enough information to support codifying the community engagement plan into a law as specified in the warrant article. The petitioners believe a community engagement plan will provide a standard blueprint to determine what people <coughs> want to know, where they can find it, and how to improve engagement overall. The advisory committee is sympathetic to the petitioners' concern about the growing lack of trust in government because of lack of timely and widespread dissemination of information. However, they have many concerns about codifying into law a plan that has not been fully developed and for which there are no estimates of cost. If the plan were adopted, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations would, would require additional staffing to design and implement a community engagement plan. In a zero-sum budget environment, it is critical to know where the funds would come from. The advisory committee was also concerned that the, pose, that the proposed law applies to all department heads, all appointed or elected officials, all members of boards, commissions, and committees. Many committees in this town are run by volunteers who do not receive very much support. If there is a greater burden placed upon them, the town needs to budget for help or risk losing volunteers. Overall, the advisory committee concludes that more information is needed. Therefore, a substitute motion was made to refer the substance of the Warren article to the Commission for Diversity and Communi Inclusion in Community Relations for further development. The advisory committee's substitute motion charges the commission um, to one, develop a, a draft community engagement plan, 
two, analyze how similar plans have worked in other communities, and three, to provide a cost analysis. By a vote of 18 in favor, six opposed, and two abstains, the advisory committee recommends favorable action on its substitute motion. Thank you, Ms. Nobrega. Thank you. Mariah Nobrega, town meeting member, precinct four, um, and co-petitioner on this foreign article. And I apologize, I'm, I think I'm gonna have to turn my back to the audience so I can see what's going on over here. Um, so, uh, the, um, why we would like you to vote against referral of warrant article 30. Can you hear me okay? Am I close enough to the mic? Get closer, okay, is that better? Okay, thank you. Um, so why do we need this warrant article now? A recent <laughs> example. And I want to um, first say that um, this is an example of uh, an email that came from um, Mel Kleckner that we all received. It was forwarded to the Town Meeting um, Members Association listserv. Um, and it was about the, um, the, reduction, the voluntary reduction in hours by NETA. And the bottom of it says something very important. And, and, and I want to commend, it's from um, Town Administrator Mel Kleckner, and I want to commend him for his intentions in sending this email which it says, in order to distribute this information widely, I would appreciate it if one of you, this is going to the select board members, if one of you would post this information to the town meeting member listserv and other appropriate media, including the Brookline Townwide Discussion Facebook site. Great intentions, this is not the way we should be informing the public, is by an email from the administrator to the select board members asking them to post it to Facebook. Um, great intentions, bad execution, and in fact, it didn't happen. The select board members didn't post it to uh, the Facebook group. It ended up that one of, the, um, one of the town meeting members who received this actually posted it in partial information. And so this is just a case study of great intentions. We all wanna do well, but we need to do better and we need to have a formal structure by which that happens. Um, so why vote against referral? We don't wanna wait. A draft plan is necessary. There are numerous excellent municipal plans already in existence that the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations can use as a draft. Um, we, we don't need the, uh, the commission to develop the draft. These, dr these plans already exist. One is um, just an example here from Seattle. This is a, a plan that is a, a municipal-wide plan. If you go to Boston, Boston actually has custom plans for um, their key divisions. On the left, you can see the um, Planning and Development Agency, and on the right, the Public Health Commission. So really, there's different options here, but the point is, draft plans exist, they're widely available. CDICR does not need to reinvent that wheel. Evaluation process is costly and cumbersome. Um, the bylaw only says that the community engagement um, indicators be developed for each department and committee. Many of them have this already. Um, and progress would be included in annual reviews and reappointment. Um, we already have indicators. We already have annual review. We already have reappointment um, review for our, um, our members of boards and commissions and committees. The only thing that this does is it elevates community engagement as something that should be part of that process explicitly um, as opposed to not addressed at all. Um, there's no estimation of cost was another point made as to why to refer. Actually, there was a cost estimate was provided by the director and it was um, principally pointed out to be at one FTE. He is um, planning, is my understanding, to request that FTE um, in any case because as we've heard, as we've heard in multiple uh, uh, warrant discussions tonight, um, the office has significant responsibilities and they are understaffed for those responsibilities. So this FTE would be requested whether or not um, this were to be going ahead. Um, the other thing that I want to point out, which Deborah alluded to a little bit earlier, is that um, there's actually a great financial, financial benefit to, um, to uh, pursuing this type of community engagement plan. Um, in my research, I actually found this great report that was prepared for the San Francisco Controller's Office. Um, and basically what it said is that there's likely economic savings. Um, and this is really um, about increased, increased public awareness, public adherence, um, and also um, the community engagement process actually improves the project planning phase, which then, as we've all heard, again, so much about, um, allows us to shorten the um, planning and the construction phases of projects. So that's tremendous. And then 
um, in general, more about community engagement and bond rating. And this relates directly to what we heard earlier about BFAC um, and the issues that are going on there. Um, and I just want to point out that this quote, it says, more and more the government is asking for assistance from the, from the public, and this is from the San Francisco Controller's uh, report, um, in the form of earmarked funding like bond measures for capital improvements. Does that sound familiar? The government's ability to get bond measures passed for infrastructure and other capital projects is directly linked to the public's confidence that bond money is going to be used effectively to produce the results promised. This makes successful community engagement critical for trust and confidence leading to support for passing future bonds. So as we think about the lessons of BFAC that we're going to be hearing about next week, we really need to think about how community engagement is, is integral and directly linked to the work of BFAC in overall financial and fiscal health of our town. Um, so finally, let's say vote no on referral and yes on the main motion. Um, we need this now, we have draft plans, we already do evaluation, the direct costs will be requested anyway, and there may be significant savings through bond costs, policy adherence, and project scheduling. So thank you. Mr. Fernandez. And Mr. Lepson, you're next. Raul Fernandez for the select board. Uh, uh, before I begin, just want to thank you for your vote on the previous article. Uh, and I also want to, um, I, I sort of stepped uh, back there with Mr. Karen before and gave him a personal apology. I want to make sure I give a public apology. I think in the heat of the moment, we were, we were having a little back and forth, and, and, uh, and I think I was a, a little too snippy with you, and so I do apologize publicly for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, oh, I'm not done, though. Um, also, um, <laughs> to Ms. Khan. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I made a joke at the expense of the advisory committee, uh, and I, you know, I do re regret any offense. Um, while that certainly wasn't my intention, I appreciate that impact and intention can be different things, uh, and I want to make sure that I, that I apologize for the impact of that joke. Uh, certainly respect the work that the advisory committee does, and I'll be sure to do better next time, so thank you for that. Um, all right, if I can begin now, um, I'm going to start by reading the board's perspective on this uh, Warren article, and then actually offer a little bit of my own. Uh, so, here we go. Article 30 is a petitioned article that asks the town to establish a bylaw creating a community engagement plan. The board is supportive of efforts to broaden the reach of community members so that there is increased public involvement in policy making. The board agrees that a proper plan would allow for a stronger government where community members feel invested in the town's decision making. The board has acknowledged that there is a need to improve the process for appointments to board uh, and commit to boards and commissions, a major component of the town's community engagement. The board believes that there will be noticeable improvements in the coming year now that there is a dedicated resource assigned to manage the coordination and maintenance of the appointment and term review process. That's within our office. Uh, the board agrees uh, with the advisory committee that a draft plan is necessary in order to support the establishment of this bylaw and understands the requirements of the plan. Uh, the board looks forward to learning how this plan will enhance existing efforts to engage with members of the community. Uh, and so the board did was vote uh, unanimously vote favorable action on the mo motion offered by the advisory commission, uh, by advisory committee, sorry. Uh, so what I'll say is, uh, is we heard this a couple different times and we approved it the first time and then voted uh, on the AC motion the second time. Uh, there was, uh, it, it seems, a scheduling error and the petitioner wasn't able to be there the second time. Uh, and one of the things that, that, that you may not know about the way that we, you know, we sort of discuss this stuff sometimes about a month before we're even here, uh, and you know, and, and I didn't move reconsideration on this, but I will say I do, I do plan to vote on the petitioner's motion um, today. Um, you, you know, you, you've got all the facts in front of you. You you know that um, at least now four select board members are in, are in favor of of the motion presented by the advisory committee. I just wanted to offer that to you, so when you see up on the board, uh, if we do an electronic vote, which I assume we will, that my name will be in the yes category for the petitioner's motion. But um, you've got all the information, and you can do as you will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lepson. And uh, there's a correction in the vote on the, on, under uh, Article 24, 109 in favor, 22 opposed, and 29 abstentions. Mr. Lepson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening. Uh, Robert Lepson, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 9, also um, speaking on behalf of the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. Um, unanimous, in fact, uh, we want to support the main motion, absolutely, and no to the referral. 
And in terms of an explanation, I will paraphrase uh, my friend, uh, select board member uh, Fernandez, what Deborah Brown said, what Mariah Nobrega said, and what select board member Fernandez said in part two of his um, speech. That's the explanation, No, fur nothing further from me, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neufein. Thank you, Bettina Neufeind, uh, Town Meeting Member Precinct 1. Um, I'd like to speak in favor of the petitioner's motion as well. Um, I think community engagement often falls into the category of things not done well because they are important but not urgent. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the little category of you know how they overlap. It can be either important, uh, urgent, not important, not urgent, uh, but unless it is urgent, um, it tends to kind of fall by the wayside and become an afterthought. Um, having a community engagement plan really addresses this head on by adding community engagement across the board to accountability metrics. This plan would address the fact that the devil is indeed, as was mentioned earlier this evening, in the details. It would improve communication on the front end around community-wide projects and avoid things like the override vote in May uh, where many, many of the parents that when I was organizing at Lawrence uh, to turn out voters had no idea that B-Space was still an issue, that um, a ninth school had not been decided on and was not in fact being built um, and were shocked that they were being asked to vote um, for, uh, for a project that they thought had been a, a done deal. This plan would help us to vary the voices and vary the people who are asked over and over to do the same, uh, you know, five or 10 people who are asked to be on the committees, who are asked to, to do the volunteering. Um, so many people in this town, when I tell them that I am coming to town meeting, don't know what it is, don't know how you get here, aren't aware that it's open to the public, don't know that it's televised. Um, so there is just a real communication gap in how this town is run, um, and it is disconnected from how interested people are in actually being involved. You have one minute. Um, finally, I think uh, just creating public support and buy-in for projects large and small is really um, the ultimate payoff, and I really encourage everyone to vote yes on the main motion. Thank you, Ms. Benko. Carla Benko, town meeting member, precinct 13. Um, I support the idea of a community engagement plan for lots of reasons. I think um, it's, it's uh, an indication of good government to have an informed public and an educated voter. But what I do have a problem with is voting something into our bylaws that doesn't, isn't particularly uh, detailed. And I'm trying to recall the last time the town meeting passed a bylaw whose main component was not fully spelled out, but rather presented in an outline form. And I was wondering if anybody could help uh, me refresh my memory as when we passed bylaws without really knowing the details. Thank you. On the uh, motion for referral on page 3-6, Am I going to get to the read uh, Sharon Abramowitz's? Um. Well, if you insist. Thank you. You do. Thank you. Uh, so Sharon Abramowitz um, was here until a couple of minutes ago, but she had to go home to um, because her babysitter had to leave, and so she asked me to read her remarks. Um, so I'm going to do that. My name is Sharon Abramowitz from Precinct 12. I'm a current member of the school committee, but I am here speaking for myself in support of Warrant Article 30. As an anthropologist, I work with the United Nations to globalize community engagement to local and national governments and humanitarian agencies. Low, middle, and high-income countries are getting on board quickly because hard experience has shown that community engagement is necessary to achieve many of the goals that communities and countries care about. They have come to see that community engagement is the remedy to failed campaigns, distrusting populations, and community member, taxpayer, and voter rejection and refusal of government initiatives. In order to understand community engagement, it helps if you imagine our community as a body with vascular system. Information often moves one directionally through our arteries and veins, but is too blunt to reach the capillaries of our community. 
Community engagement, on the other hand, is two-way, ultra-local, and carries information from the center to peripheries of our community and back again. It carries unheard voices to the center of decision-making and improves the responsiveness of our leadership. It <coughs> creates transparency, accountability, participation, and inclusion, all necessary and vital public goods that are essential for the healthy functioning of the town of Brookline. How it does this is in the details of the plan prescribed in Warren Article 30. As it should be, it must be fit for place and fit for our purposes under the direction of the DICR. I can attest that Warren Article 30 is consist consistent with new international standards to strengthen community engagement worldwide and it deserves your support. Warren Article 30 emphasizes that community engagement coordination, integration, resource mobilization, and budgeting as, are as important as the talking and listening that comprises the work of co effective community engagement. It, is, it achieves this goal by essentially compelling the town to develop a community engagement plan, which is really an overlay over existing town functions and capacities. You have one minute. Existing town engagement efforts are familiar to us. They include vaccination campaigns, public works alerts, snow removal, de declaration of weather emergencies, and notifications about, s about school activities. But here in Brookline, when we talk about community engagement, we tend to talk about public discourse around hot button issues like pot and electric scooters. Often to wonder why people don't engage at the right time in the right processes. This reflects how we do community engagement. Our current piecemeal approach to community engagement is episodic and controversy or crisis driven. That's not how it has to be. Warren Article 30 will enable us to coordinate our existing systems, procedures, activities, and resources to communicate better, accept feedback better, and integrate feedback into town functions better in routine operations. I encourage you to vote favorable action on Warren Article 30. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Ernie Fry, Precinct 7. Um, I want to expand a little bit on the comments made by Ms. Benka. I think they are very relevant, and it seems like the uh, Committee of Town Organization and Structure may, should have um, had a, an opinion on this uh, article and wondering if they were ever approached about, the, uh, about this article. No. no. Uh, is, that, is, there, is that something that should have been done, in your opinion, Mr. Moderator, well, or not? Uh, the Committee on Town Organization and Structure reads the warrant, makes up its own mind as to what articles are within its purview, and it apparently did not feel that it uh, needed to weigh in on this one Very for good. its own Thank reasons. Thank you. On the referral motion on the bottom of page 30-6 to refer the subject matter of Article 30 to the CIDR uh, to report back at the fall 2020 town meeting, uh, you, 35 town meeting members want a recorded vote, and they do. Uh, if you vote in favor of this referral motion, we will not vote on the main motion. If you vote against the referral motion, we will then vote on the main motion. Is that clear to everybody? Thank you. This is uh, Article 30 referral motion. If you favor referral, press 1. If you oppose it, press 2. If you abstain, press 3. Uh, that motion fails by a vote of 71 in favor, 82 opposed, and three abstentions. On the main motion, on page 30-1,
Those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, motion carries by a majority vote. We turn now to articles 32 through 34. We'll have a single debate, such as it is. There's no opposition uh, on these three articles. The motion under Article 32 <coughs> is on page 32-2, moved by Ms. Heller, seconded by Ms. Carroll, to amend the town's general bylaws by substituting in every case quote, chair for chairman and chairperson. Article 33, the main motion is on the TAN supplement, supplement number three, moved by Mr. Gordon, seconded by Mr. Franco, this goes six pages uh, of motion, uh, <coughs> to um, make various changes in the wording of a series of bylaws and Article 34, the main motion is on the rose-colored supplement that was passed out last night, uh, pages 6 through 12, moved by Mr. Gordon, seconded by Mr. Swartz, to make certain other wording changes in uh, a number of different bylaw sections, which uh, Mr. Gordon is about to explain to you. Uh, Mr. Gordon, you're on. Well. Is she speaking in place of you, Mr. Gordon? I'm sorry? Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Hadassah Margolis, town meeting member from Precinct 8. Language has power. It has the power to alienate and harm, and the power to connect and make space. Changing gendered chairman to gender neutral chair in Brookline's bylaws is an easy, inexpensive, and effective way to create opportunity and agency for marginalized perspectives. A simple document search and replace to include and empower. This is a small but meaningful act in our lifelong process to do better and truly get to a place where everyone feels heard and respected. To change our vocabulary is not earth shattering. It's a start. Please vote yes for Article 32. Mr. Gordon. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I. Uh, <coughs> Please turn to Article 33, page uh, 3 of the TAN supplement. Uh, Mr. Gordon reminds me that there's one wording change. Uh, <clears throat> the very bottom line on that page reads, by concerned s members of the public, strike members of the public and substitute the word residents. So that line will read, by concerned residents or by a town official, et cetera. That is uh, part of the main motion. Mr. Gordon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Neil Gordon, still the precinct one town meeting member, member of the advisory committee, speaking as petitioner of the, uh, we're almost done, please don't leave yet, articles 33 and 34, <laughs> and also co-petitioner of article 32. Uh, two years ago, the deciding vote on a contentious matter before the transportation board was cast by a resident of Newton, a uh, member who had moved out of town, perhaps taking her skin in the game with her. And thus began, uh, began my dive into the bylaws, and here's what I found. On most Brookline boards, committees, and commissions, you need to be a Brookline resident in order to serve. Fair enough. But on others, you need to be a resident only when you're appointed. On at least one, you need to be a resident only when you're nominated. Whether to serve, be appointed, or be nominated, to join most of the bodies cited in the bylaws, you need to be a resident. But for the Parks and Recreation Commission, the bylaws don't say. For the Council on Aging, the bylaws say you need to be a citizen. At-large advisory committee members, those that are not town meeting members, need to be voters. 
In broad terms, the motion on Article 34 does two things. First, it limits those making decisions on our behalf to Brookline residents, but with exceptions for the Commission for Women and the Commission on Disability, where specific needs were expressed. While that objective is limiting, the second is expansive. Replacing the citizen and voter barriers with the word resident, favorable action on Article 34 will let any Brookline resident, citizen or not, participate in town government to the full extent of the law. Let me speak a bit about Article 33. Searching the bylaws for words like citizen, voter, and resident, I found narrow and often exclusionary language. Those words, citizen, voter, and resident, when read in context, don't define my view of the role of our town government and whom broadly we serve. The current bylaws narrowly call for notifying, warning, and protecting residents, and in some cases, even more narrowly, citizens. I'll skip the details and cut to the bottom line. The words of our bylaws should express our efforts, as imperfect as they may be, to be a welcoming community. Welcoming to those who live here, those who work here, those who are just passing through. For the most part, not all, the words of the public make more sense than the narrower words resident and citizen. It took six nights for us to get to this point, and it's satisfying to end what's been a sometimes contentious fall town meeting with articles that have the petitioners, the select board, the advisory committee, the committee on town organization and structure, and the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations aligned as we conclude. I especially want to thank uh, CTO and S members Dick Benka and Harry Boers for leading a thorough review of Articles 33 and 34, respectively, and select board members, my advisory committee colleagues, and the moderator their patience, for their patience in considering and reconsidering the many moving parts of Articles 33 and 34. I ask you for a vote of favorable action on Articles 32, 33, and 34, and wish you happy holidays. Thank you. Ms. Carroll and Mr. Swartz for the advisory committee. And Bank of Boers will be next. Carol Carroll, uh, town meeting member, precinct 10, speaking for the advisory committee. Warrant Article 32 seeks to amend the wording of the general bylaws to be consistent with the resolution passed by town meeting in November of 2017, calling for the use of gender neutral language in the conduct of town business. The proposal would bring the language of the bylaw into conformity into conformity with the observed practice of many town boards, commissions, and committees in referring to their chair. The advisory committee recommends favorable action on warrant article 32 by a vote of 32 in favor, one opposed, and two not voting. Chuck Swartz, Precinct 9, speaking for the Advisory Committee. Uh, I'll keep this brief because Neil and Hadassah said most We're of everything. We're very grateful needed. to you. Good, good. Uh, just a couple of things I wanted to point out that uh, to stand out. Um, first of all, for Article 33, we'd rather the public be notified of um, snow parking bans than just inhabitants of the town. We would rather noise control shall apply to the public rather than just Brookline citizens. These are some of the examples that these changes will help to rectify. As to Article um, 34, um, one change uh, is that the moderator shall appoint members of the advisory committee as opposed to citizens of. Uh, this could uh, allow for um, a wider perspective of people who are not um, necessarily classified as citizens, but uh, could serve as members of the advisory committee. So the advisory committee recommends favorable action on Article 33 by a vote of 16 to 1 with two abstentions, and favorable action on Article 34 by a vote of 13 to 8 with two abstentions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benko. Welcome back. Dick Benko for the Committee on Town Organization and Structure. I'll be saying a few words very briefly on Article 33, and Harry Bors will 
follow up with comments about Article 34. With a few recommended changes, CTO and S endorsed Articles 33 and 34. All of our recommendations were accepted by Petitioner Gordon and are incorporated in the votes that you have before you tonight. Let me just highlight a couple. In particular, CTO and S agreed with the desire to eliminate the term citizen from our bylaws. We felt that this specific change was particularly timely given the corrosive national political environment and its demeaning of non-citizens. CTO and S believes that residents of the town who may not be U.S. citizens can nonetheless be directly affected by town policies and can also contribute significant, uh, significantly to the political discourse and as members of town boards and commissions if appointed to those positions. We also felt on another point that it was important to permit interested parties such as local businesses to offer views on town policies that might directly affect them even if those owners of those businesses are not town residents. So that change is also incorporated. All of our uh, recommendations are in the reports before you, but let me just add one final point. The petitioner sought to address <coughs> language that had developed over decades at the hands of various drafters. That language was inconsistent, that language was also somewhat loaded in terms of our political environment nowadays. The task that he undertook involved sifting through hundreds of pages of town bylaws. It was a thankless task. So let me thank him today and thank you. Mr. Boers. Good evening, Harry Boers speaking on behalf of CTOS. I'll be speaking to Article 34. Um, Article 34, we had several meetings around it. Uh, we get it, it's complicated, there are a lot of moving parts. Um, what I'll try and do is move through it as quickly as I can. As we've heard that over the years, we've had various bylaws which have really given us sort of a dog's breakfast of terms. Not that there's anything wrong with a dog's breakfast, if you're a dog. Uh, so broadly speaking, Article 34 attempts to reconcile the inconsistencies of terminology within the bylaws uh, as it applies to town committees, boards, commission uh, appointments. It ensures also that everyone has to be a resident um, in addition to the consistency of terms. So what that means in some cases it now imposes a residency requirement where none existed. That was intentional. Um, there are a couple of things that do not fall into this broadly speaking uh, box. So let me just quickly touch on those. There's the phrase, so long as uh, they remain residents, and that was to get around the issue that the petitioner brought up that somebody's appointed on a Tuesday and moves out of town on a Wednesday. Uh, within the advisory committee, there is a notable change that was discussed, uh, and it involves the moderator appointing town meeting members from each uh, precinct. It introduces the phrase to the extent practicable, uh, that's because, as we know, the moderator appoints town meeting members from each precinct, but he can't always get somebody when it's time to appoint. You can't force people to do it. We understand that happens from time to time. Um, there was concern that somehow this could allow some moderator to potentially stack the deck. We think that that's a limited possibility, and if that were ever to happen in the future, we suspect that this body or the community would rein it in quickly. More importantly though, keep in mind there are a couple of lawyers on CTOS, I don't happen to be one, but they pointed out that without this added phrase, and knowing that this can occur, in fact it does occur, best efforts aside, that we are then tacitly countenancing a violation of the bylaw. So we think this is a needed phrase to be inserted. Uh, Parks and Rec, as you heard, was just same practice, we're just codifying it here. The main thrust of the article is to use the term resident as a common term, and that applies to several of our boards, committees, commission, um, and we think this uh, consistency is justified. We heard there were two instances where it will not apply, that to the Commission on Women, which we agree with, as well as the Brookline Commission on Disability. So we think both having it not apply to those two were both uh, good choices. To the remaining um, uh, bylaw committees, boards, commissions that applies to, CTOS, Audit Committee, Board of Appeals, Preservation Commission, Naming Committee, 
Those we believe have a more intimate relationship with the town, both capital T and small t, and requiring members to be residents is warranted, and so therefore the CTOS agrees, and we feel that town meeting should support, support Warrant Article 34. Thank you. So your moderator has uh, been in violation of the bylaw for probably three or four years out of his tenure, and nobody picked that up for some reason. Uh, Mr. Franco. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ben Franco for the Select Board. Um, article, warrant Articles 32 and 34, uh, through 34 um, propose to expand and build upon previous efforts by town meeting and town government to make Brookline its policies and its bylaws more inclusive. The board supports and applauds this effort. The board uh, joins the petitioner, the advisory committee, the uh, CTONS, DICR, um, and others in urging a vote of favorable action. Thank you, Mr. Nanian. Mr. Lepson, you're next. Mr. Nanian passes. Mr. Lepson passes. Mr. Burstein. Michael A. Burstein, Precinct 12. I know it's late. Um, you may recall two years ago I filed the Board of Select Women article and Alex Coleman filed the article for gender neutral language. Um, the one thing that tells me that it is important for us to vote in favor of Article 32, which I suspect we're all very much inclined to do so, is the fact that it reminds the world about our attempts to be inclusive. Um, it has been two years since we have had a select board, and I have counted at least 36 times that members of this body have referred to the Board of Selectmen or the Selectmen tonight. Nobody, I'm sure, is doing that deliberately to, like, irk us, but it's just that it's the language that we've all been used to all of our lives. Language that shapes our thought and language that basically can make people think perhaps they're not welcome in certain situations. So I encourage everybody here to vote in favor of Article 32. Thank you. Mr. Friedman. Harry Friedman, Precinct 12. On Article 32, um, both the petitioners and uh, Mr. Franco and Mr. Burstein have all uh, pointed out the gender neutral uh, stance we're trying to take. My question is, had the petitioners chosen to go with chairperson instead of chair, would this have been any more or less gender neutral? Yes. <laughs> would it? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Would it have been more gender neutral or less gender neutral? Uh, well, each, each one of them is gender neutral. So why didn't we go with chairperson? To, in order to be consistent throughout the bylaws, I suspect, is the answer to that. Uh, uh, my understanding is that they were changing the instances of chairman, and they wanted to go gender neutral. My question was, <coughs> why couldn't they have gone with chairperson? Mr. Benka? Mr. Gordon. Yeah, Neil Gordon, Precinct 1, town meeting member. Uh, chair is in common usage throughout the town right now, and uh, that's the one I selected in my drafting. Thank you. Now, Mr. Rosenthal, you are the last speaker of our very long town meeting, and I'm sure you'll be brief. Um, in, in, in fact, um, Well, I, tell us I'm who you are. Marty Rosenthal, Precinct 9, and Chair Pax, uh, I actually have what I want to uh, address as a point of order. Really? Yes. <laughs> um, the point of order is I want to thank the moderator for his incredible time that he put in on this warrant and his usual <laughs> excellent job. Mr. Moderator, I echo um, Mr. Rosenthal, but I wish to point out that was not a point of order. I believe that was a question of personal privilege. That's, that's exactly right. Exactly right, Mr. Burstein. On the, uh, we now proceed to vote on uh, Articles 32 through 34. <clears throat> on the motion on page 
32-2. Those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed? The motion carries by a vote of 165 to 1. On Article 33, pages 1 through 6 of Supplement number, uh, number 3, TAN Supplement, those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, please stand. <laughs> Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> Article 34. Motion on uh, the rose-colored supplement, pages 6 to 12. Those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, please stand. The motion carries unanimously. It's great to end this town meeting with two unanimous votes. Yes. My vote was not in all. I'm sorry? My vote was not in all. It was a mistake. I voted yes on Article 32. Okay. That's fine. Well, I will now entertain a motion to dissolve town meeting. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. M motion carries unanimously. Happy holidays, everybody, and thank you for your cooperation.